All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to another episode of the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. I'm the author of Love Hope Lime, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. The book is available on Amazon, but the PDF version, the e-version of the book has always been free for chronic Lyme survivors. Jennifer, Jeremy, and Jenna, I've given out over 1,500 PDFs of the book since it was published. It's always going to be free for chronic Lyme survivors. If you want a signed copy, reach out to me via Facebook or LinkedIn or freddiamond.com, and I'd be happy to get one signed and sent out to you. If you're listening to today's podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you get your podcast, thank you so much. If you're listening on Apple, feel free to give me a five-star review. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you so much. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and give a nice comment as well. So I'm very excited for today's show. When I was doing the research for my book, Love, Hope, Lyme, with family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor, I had no idea that the concept of gaslighting was a thing. I did not know that. I thought that Lyme was a treatable disease at the chronic stage. People who've read my book know the story. And uh, I was shocked to know that Lyme survivors, patients have been continually uh, gaslighted throughout their their, their Lyme experiences. An amazing report came out in December, December 29th of 2023, Medical Gaslighting and Lyme Disease, the Patient Experience. And uh, we have the, the authors of the report on today's Love Hope Lyme podcast. And uh, we're going to get deep into this. And it's it's such an important report. I know you've done a lot of distribution to a lot of the Facebook groups that cover Lyme, but I'm excited that we're going to be talking about it today on the podcast. I'm actually going to read the opening paragraphs. A lot of people are listening to this as a podcast, and I want to give them some context of what we're doing here. And here's the opening paragraphs. Even though there are approximately half a million new cases of Lyme disease in the U.S. annually, According for the Centers for Disease Control, it is often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, which can result in a chronic multisystemic condition. Lyme disease is a recognized public health threat and is a designated notifiable disease. As such, Lyme disease is mandated to be reported by the CDC. Despite this, both acute and chronic Lyme disease have been relegated to the category of contested illnesses, in quotes, which can lead to medical gaslighting. By analyzing results from an online survey of respondents with Lyme disease, 986 people, we elucidate the lived experiences of people who have been pushed to the margins of the medical system by having their systems attributed to mental illness, anxiety, stress, and aging. Further, respondents have had their blood tests and rashes discounted, and we're told that chronic Lyme disease simply does not exist. As a result, a series of fruitless consultations often result in the delay of a correct diagnosis, which has deleterious consequences. Again, the report is called Medical Gaslighting and Lyme Disease. My guests today are the authors of the report. Dr. Jennifer Fagan is an associate professor of sociology at Lamar University with a PhD in sociology from Northeastern University. She has also taught courses at Northeastern University and Bentley University. Her research, focus, her research focus is on marginalized groups. Jenna Luce Thayer is a former senior advisor to the United States government and the United Nations for transparency, accountability, human rights, and is the author of Slime, How Medical Codes Mortally Wound Corruption and Scientific Fraud. She helped revise the World Health Organization's uh, ICD-11 codes to recognize life-threatening complications from Lyme disease. And we have Dr. Jeremy Shelton. He's an associate professor and chair, Department of Psychology at Lamar University. All right. First of all, I want to congratulate the three of you on this, my, uh, what's the word, milestone report. Uh, let's get started. Jen, what led you to embark upon this research? Uh, Fred, to answer your question, let me start by defining what uh, contested illnesses are. Contested illnesses are conditions that lack cultural legitimacy as their nature in even their existence is often questioned. Any physical manifestations or symptoms may be deemed purely subjective 
as they lack objective biological markers. The result is that patients are in the unfortunate position of having to convince medical practitioners that they're actually in need of medical attention, often leading to seeing many, many doctors before receiving a proper diagnosis. Uh, in addition, people with contested illnesses might not qualify for disability, despite their inability to work. Insurance may not cover their treatments, and they could be denied the social recognition of their condition. So this leads me to your question, which is that one of the reasons Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease are such fascinating topics to me is that they are viewed as contested illnesses, despite the fact that there is such a high incidence of them in the US and um, internationally, and also because they often have objective biological markers, such as blood tests and the EM or bullseye rash. And so it's really quite counterintuitive that they are considered contested, that they are considered contested illnesses. You know, one of the things that was remarkable when I did my research for the book, Love, Hope, Lyme, I didn't know this. I met some like thousands of people as I was doing the research and since then, and I've met people who've gone to 10, 15, 20, 25 doctors mm -hmm. before they were finally diagnosed with Lyme disease. And along the way, it was, you don't have this, you don't have Lyme, Lyme doesn't exist here, et cetera. Uh, finally, you know, the doctors would say, uh, we don't believe you have anything because we can't test for it. You know, it's probably in your head. And I've heard that so many times. My first mm -hmm. guest on the podcast was Dr. Richard Harwitz, who said he had a patient who had seen over 85 to 100 doctors before he was able to diagnose them with Lyme. Uh, Jeremy, which countries were included in the survey? Well, we had respondents from a total of, I believe it was 28 uh, different countries. However, 90% of our respondents, excuse me, 95% came from five specific countries. And those were the United States, Australia, Canada, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. And just overall, we had uh, 986 responses that we could use in our analysis. And we had a wide variety of people of different ages, education levels, careers. Uh, the only limitation that I would mention from our sample was uh, we had very, very few uh, African-American respondents. So what are some of your findings regarding the incidence and prevalence of gaslighting techniques experienced by your respondents? Um, are there demographic variables such as geographic location and gender that correlate with a higher incidence of medical gaslighting? Well, the, the kind of highlights of the specific gaslighting techniques that we found were fairly common among our sample. The most common one by far was doctors just telling their patients, you're just overreacting to these symptoms, which uh, is, is really unfortunate because it doesn't really address those symptoms at all. It essentially ignores them. Uh, other reactions that we found that were common were implying that the symptoms were psychosomatic. Now, for your listeners who are not familiar with that term, a psychosomatic symptom is one that essentially that just means it's in your head, that it has no biological basis or physiological basis and could be implied that you're just imagining it. Or uh, in some cases, some people interpret that to mean you're making this up. So obviously that means the the doctor is not taking the patient's complaint seriously. Uh, other people were commonly told that their symptoms were just a product of normal aging. So mm -hmm. again, passing off the responsibility of the symptoms to a cause other than Lyme. Uh, many patients were told there's just no such thing as chronic Lyme disease. So you're wrong. You don't have this. It's something else. Uh, a few people were told that uh, it was it was fairly common that their symptoms were due actually to mental illness. So it's one thing to say it's psychosomatic. Uh, it's a whole another category to say that you actually are suffering from some sort of mental illness. I can't imagine what those people felt like to hear that coming from a medical professional. And still others were commonly told that their symptoms were just due to stress. So the common theme that you can see here that we found throughout our survey is that doctors were trying to argue either the symptoms were due to some other cause besides Lyme disease, 
or that the symptoms were entirely fictitious and just in the person's head, or they should just learn to live with those symptoms. And of course, that's not what you want to hear when you go to a medical professional. Uh, as, as far, to answer your other question, as far as uh, the demographic variables, uh, there, there actually weren't many, and that was somewhat surprising. Uh, age and sex did not correlate from what we could tell. Uh, with a higher incidence of medical gaslighting. So basically what that means is this is an equal opportunity problem and uh, it doesn't matter really who you are, how old you are, what your gender is. Uh, you're just as likely to experience this as the next person. Um, the, dem uh, the demographic variables that did correlate though with medical gaslighting, interestingly enough, there were two. One is within our U.S. sample, we looked at the state of residence that each person reported, and we found there are certain states, according to the CDC, that are known as Lyme endemic. All that means is that Lyme disease is rather prevalent in those states. The ticks that carry it are also rather prevalent, and your odds of contracting it in those locations are higher. And so what we did was we just organized or categorized our participants in the U.S. as either living in one of those states or not, and then compared their gaslighting experiences. And we did find some, some systematic differences uh, based on where they were living. And basically what we found was people who were in Lyme endemic states where Lyme disease was more common, uh, it took them less time to receive a Lyme diagnosis than people in other states. They also had to see fewer doctors to receive that diagnosis. And they were less likely to be told their symptoms were just psychosomatic or due to stress or some other type of cause besides Lyme disease, which if you think about it, that does make sense. The other result, and this somewhat surprised me, was country of residence did seem to impact uh, our results somewhat. And what I mean by that is, again, as I said at the beginning, there are five countries that made up the vast majority of our sample were the US, Australia, Canada, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. So we compared respondents across those five countries to see uh, what kind of medical gaslighting experiences they had. And what we found was uh, that our respondents in Australia were particularly more likely to experience uh, doctors not believing their blood test results that indicated they had Lyme, uh, and also just refusing to administer those blood tests when the, when the patient requested it. So I'm not sure why that is, but that was the pattern that we found. Yeah. I mean, when I first published my book, the day it was published, the Lyme Disease Association of Australia did a review uh, of my book and talked into the review about a lot of the things that you just said. You know, one of the reasons why I wrote my book, Love, Hope, Lyme, was because when patients are getting gaslighted, it's not just the patient who suffers, it's their whole family. You know, and I've heard stories where a father or a brother or a mother or sister, or whatever, would say, well, the doctor just said, you don't have this disease. So it's probably in your head. So, you know, why are you faking this disease? Or he just said, the doctor just said, you don't have it. And then it just, it escalates the challenge and the stress and everything related to it. Did patients feel gaslighted even when testing indicated that they were infected or that the, uh, the bullseye rash was indeed evident? Uh, there's sort of two answers to the bullseye rash question. Overall, across our entire sample, so all 986 people, that specific form of gaslighting was actually reported as the least prevalent. That doesn't mean no one experienced it, but compared to the other forms, it was much less common. However, and the flip side to that answer is when we looked specifically at the U.S. sample, and we looked at people who were in a geographic location that was not Lyme endemic. That is where the fewer number of people who said they received that message from the doctor, that was primarily where it was happening. So doctors were basically saying, look, you don't live, uh, we're not in a Lyme endemic state here. Lyme disease is very uncommon. So it really is unlikely you have it, despite them having the rash that is most commonly associated with it. Yeah. And yeah. Fred, I wanted to just make clear that our results regarding sex differences uh, as to whether patients were experienced medical gaslighting 
should are not necessarily able to be extrapolated to the general population of Lyme patients. As we know, there are studies that show that women are more likely to be med experience medical gaslighting in general, and uh, Lyme patients who are women are more likely to experience medical gaslighting. However, we did have an underrepresentation of male respondents. So we're only reporting what we gleaned from our data. Yeah, I appreciate that point. I mean, one of my past episodes of the Love Hope Line podcast was with a jet pilot named Nicole Malakowski. And she was at the highest level of service to the government, a jet pilot. And mm -hmm. she got Lyme disease during training in North Carolina in 2012. And she went through all of the symptoms that typical chronic Lyme survivors go through. She told this story on her episode of my podcast, where she eventually went to, and the, the Air Force gave a lot of, um, they did a lot of testing, they sent her to various clinics, but they could never really fully admit that she had Lyme. She finally was meeting with a naval doctor, her age, same level of rank in the government, and she knew this was going to happen. She went in for the appointment. The doctor looked at her, took her hand and said, you've been a high performing woman in a man's world. Maybe this is your body saying it's just time to quit. Mm -hmm. And she saw that coming. Look, go listen, people who are listening to the podcast today, go to one of my previous episodes with uh, the wonderful Nicole Malakowski. And she said she knew it was going to come. She knew the moment the appointment was scheduled. And she said, in retrospect, she would have brought a man with her, her husband or whomever. And she said she doesn't believe that she was going to be treated as such. All right, Jenna, let's talk to you for a little bit here. What is it about chronic Lyme? that has made it so susceptible to gaslighting. And I'm curious if you have any theories regarding why Lyme patients uh, are continuously gaslighted by doctors. Well, maybe um, I need to put this into the context of the human rights framework. Um, I, I had an international committee formed to help change the World Health Organization's medical codes for Lyme disease. And in the process of doing so, we realized that having a purely scientific and medical approach to changing and improving and expanding the codes, we had to show the foundation of how it affected people's lives across the globe. And with my background in human rights, I decided to frame the experience of the Lyme patient community and those people who defend their rights. That means their rights, doctors who are treating them, family members who are advocating for them, lawyers who are uh, re representing them in court, et cetera, how they're being treated. Their, their lived experience with this Lyme patient community. And um, we poured through literature and did extensive interviews across the globe, all the different regions, um, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Canada, United States, um, Australia, Asia, and Africa. And um, basically what we found and documented was that there are 14 human rights violations across 11 international and national treaties. And a treaties is basically when countries agree to a legal contract to uphold certain norms and practices. So these are legally binding contracts that have been signed on from either all the members of the United Nations or regional treaties that have the countries represented in those regions. So they take this very seriously. And um, the treaties expand multiple regions and some were fully international. And I just wanna give you an example of the human rights violations that we found. This was reported, docu heavily documented and reported to do two different special rapporteurs at the United Nations. One who's responsible for health human rights, the other one responsible for the defenders of human rights and was also submitted and, and presented to the World Health Organization. Anyway, um, the key right that you could say the central right is the right to the highest attainable standard of health. This is a human right, highest possible attainable standard of health. So medical gaslighting clearly interferes with even coming close to achieving you know, anything that is uh, attainable. Then it interferes with the right to non-discrimination and equality being set aside as a certain patient group, um, the right to freedom from torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. And um, what's very interesting is that 
This has been tested with other marginalized groups, particularly in prison settings, because prisoners actually have specific rights for medical care and what is deemed accurate. And so we've actually seen that this has been very, you know, you take that experience from the prison setting and apply it to the general population. And if it's cruel, inhumane, and degrading in a prison setting, it certainly most certainly is in the wider society. Um, and this can include uh, with, withholding of treatment, which is a form of cruel and inhumane treatment, I mean, degrading uh, practices. It can be the psychological stress of being told there's nothing wrong with you when there is, you know, that's a form of mental torture and emotional stress. Then um, one of the more extreme forms of this gaslighting in the human rights contact and context is euthanasia. So we actually have documented cases whereby patients living in various countries are told that we cannot provide medical treatment for your condition. However, you are sick enough, unwell enough to qualify for euthanasia. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, I mean, I, I briefly touch on some of this stuff in my book and I'm really appreciate your being on the show to give a lot more of that context. You know, I've, I've met the people who've produced the quiet epidemic and I've done all the tons of research, but I, I didn't really understand the true ties back to, to the human rights, um, uh, for lack of a better word, background that was going on here. So, whoa, it's um, the fact that you can, you know, you could be told you can kill yourself be, and it, it faster and more, you have more rights to kill yourself than you do to medical care. I don't know if Jeremy or Jennifer, if that's blowing your mind, it's blowing my mind. You've probably already had this conversation with Jenna. I didn't know that. So it's just mind blowing that that is something that's part of this. I think that that particular testimony that we provided to the United Nations and World Health Organization was really what tipped the scale in expanding the codes. Mm, wow, good for you. The vast majority of your respondents were white and female. Why was that? Mm, you know, at this point, Fred, it's all conjecture, but, um, you know, so, some of the reasons can be the fact that people of color in general are, are more likely to experience medical gaslighting. So there may be fewer people of color, uh, particularly black people who haven't been diagnosed yet. Uh, also, there is a lower detection rate in people of color in general because the EM or bullseye rash presents differently on some of them. And unfortunately, uh, not all medical doctors are shown what EM rashes can look like on people of color, leading to this lower detection rate. There may be a lower incidence rate for people of color in general, um, as some authors assert, but we there's no way to know that for sure. As far as the sex ratio in our research, that, again, is conjecture, but it may have something to do with the fact that uh, part of the social construction of masculinity in society dictates that men aren't supposed to show any vulnerability. So they may be more reluctant to join these groups where we posted our survey in general. And if they do join those groups, they may be more reluctant to actually fill out the survey. We know that men are also less likely to experience medical gaslighting particularly white men. So that may be part of what, you know, part of the reason as well. Well, wow. well, once again, I, I want to thank the three of you for, for publishing the report. Again, the report is called the medical medical gaslighting and Lyme disease. The patient experience It was published December 29 of 2023. Uh, I know it's, it's on a couple of different places. Uh, Jennifer, how can this article be used to benefit Lyme patients? You know, part of the thing that's really important here to, to know when it comes to the findings of the survey is that a patient's positive blood test did not influence how likely a doctor was to believe they have Lyme disease. 
79% uh, of respondents reported their doctors were unconvinced by a positive blood test versus 74% of respondents who reported uh, that their doctor was unconvinced when there was no blood test result at all. And uh, as well, almost an average of almost 14 doctors were seen prior to receiving a Lyme disease diagnosis. So because of that, uh, the article, it's really important that this article is viewed as a tool for self-advocacy. Uh, one of the things that it's really important for patients to do is to bring research with them to doctor's appointments. This research, I feel, is pretty important, not because, not only because it contains a good deal of data from peer-reviewed medical journals that validate the existence of chronic Lyme disease, but it also provides data regarding the incidents and types of Lyme disease in our respondent pool, as Jeremy already discussed. So the latter can potentially encourage medical practitioners self-reflection if they are employing such techniques. Um, and it's also important for Lyme patients to know that these experiences are not uncommon, so they'd be less likely to doubt themselves. The, the research also has been shared among uh, medical doctors far and wide globally. Uh, medical doctors who treat Lyme disease and other medical doctors who could perhaps benefit from some education about Lyme disease and Lyme patients' experiences. So we hope this accomplishes those goals. I think it will. Again, I want to thank you all for the uh, for the insights here. Congratulations again on getting this report out. You know, it's amazing when you think about it that patients have to advocate to their doctors for what they believe is is going on with them and to prove to their doctors that they really actually have something. You know, we use all the corollaries to, you know, we talked about various groups where you went out to get some of your respondents. You know, there's no Facebook groups for people with broken ankles. You know, there's no controversy if you have a broken ankle, but there's tens of thousands of people discussing these topics every day in Facebook groups, Reddit groups, Instagram, Instagram groups, um, you know, just searching for answers. And I think a lot of what Jenna talked about uh, really gives some more, uh, you know, some more uh, of a background on, on why that is. Uh, as I say, it's just a ridiculous disease that no human being should have to endure. And I think this is report, this report is going to be very helpful in giving people the voice that they need and, uh, and the rights to get treated for this disease. All right. I want to thank all three of you again. Again, if you're listening to this on Apple podcasts, thank you. Please give us a five-star review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up. My name is Fred Diamond, and this is the Love Hope Line podcast.